Hello, hello. Welcome back to Menopause University. I would say that this is a female-only institution, but it isn't. It turns out that quite a few men are students of Menopause University also, and we're happy about that. Much of what we cover in this education pertains to health in general. Everything pertains to menopause in particular, and right now, everything pertains to Alzheimer's. And that's because we're in the middle of a huge unit on Alzheimer's disease. So far, I've taught you all about how your brain works, different kinds of dementia, and Alzheimer's itself. Now that sounds short and sweet, but those topics consumed the videos from 236 to 245. Then, given the fact that age is the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's, I taught you about how your brain ages in videos 246 and 247. And last week, in video 248, I presented the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. Well, here we are at video 249, and it's time to start addressing one of the most important risk factors for Alzheimer's being female. Now, it's not like Alzheimer's is carried on the X chromosome or anything like that. So the higher incidence of Alzheimer's in females is due to something more than just being female. It has to do with our female hormones. So we will address female hormones and Alzheimer's in four consecutive videos. This video will address the effects of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. The next video will address the effect of menopause on your brain. The one after that will address the effect of different types of menopause on your risk for Alzheimer's. And the one after that will address research on estrogen and Alzheimer's. In my book, all of chapter 33 is on Alzheimer's. The information on estrogen and, and Alzheimer's that I give you in these four videos will exceed what I've given you in the book. You know, it always strikes me odd when there are controversies over things that do not warrant any controversy. Time and time again, I encounter women who said that they are confused by the mixed messages they hear about this or that. It's a common theme in my consultations. The woman will say, I don't know whom to believe. Ever since I became postmenopausal, I've been absolutely miserable. I have every symptom on the list of 22 symptoms. My quality of life is horrible. My doctor gave me HRT and I took it for a while and I felt fantastic. But then both my girlfriend and my naturopath told me it would kill me and I got scared. So I stopped it. And now I feel horrible again. I just don't know whom to believe, my doctor or my naturopath and girlfriend. When this happens, I listen patiently as the woman goes on and on about her hormonal saga. And then I ask, what does your body say? At that, she usually looks a bit dumbfounded. So I say, you've been on HRT, and you've been off HRT. Which one did your body like best? Because our bodies talk to us. The problem is that humans are the only animals on planet Earth who refuse to listen to their bodies. We listen to fear, hype, marketing, advertising, celebrities, ignorant friends, and unqualified professionals. But for some strange reason, we refuse to listen to our own bodies. And what's odd about that is the fact that the one and only opinion that matters is your own bodies. It doesn't matter what you think or what I think. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks. All that matters is what your own body thinks. Your brain and your body may not agree, but in any contest between your brain and your body, your body will always win. Your body will either get what it wants and make you happy, or it won't get what it wants and it'll make you miserable. So I think it makes the most sense to discuss the effects of estrogen and progesterone on your brain 
by consulting your own body. Now, people differ greatly with regard to the attention they pay to their own bodies. Some people are very perceptive about every little sensation. Others don't seem to notice anything but the overwhelming sensations. If you fall into the latter category, you may find some of today's analysis meaningless, but I suspect that you'll actually figure out a few things that can help you manage your menopause. And even if you don't notice changes in your own body, maybe the people with whom you live and work notice changes in your behavior or performance that can help you connect the dots. Ask them. So what I'll do in this video is chronologically go through your hormonal life to figure out the effects of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. In fact, I'll start with childhood before you even have estrogen and progesterone circulating in your body. They have not yet even been activated, so your brain functions without them. And because they are absent, you have nary a thought about sex or your own sexuality. Your moods are even, and you have nothing to cause fluctuations in your thought processes from day to day. You follow the rules of those in authority. There is nothing to make you think you know more than they do. So instead of doing the thinking, you do the obeying. You attend school, and unless you just don't like it, or there is something upsetting you, there exists no distractions for good performance. So let's begin a graph of what your estrogen and progesterone do over the course of your lifetime, starting with childhood. This is just very basic and boring. Along the horizontal x-axis are ages from birth to 11. And the one blue line represents both estrogen and progesterone, with our, which are zero. <laughs> but then puberty comes along. Puberty is the result of an influx of high levels of both estrogen and progesterone. Here's how that would appear on our graph. So now you see the addition of ages 12, 13, 14, and 15 on the horizontal x-axis. Before age 12, both estrogen and progesterone are zero. But at age 12, they start to rise and rise and rise. Now just stop and think about puberty. You went from being an innocent little child who listened to your elders, didn't question things, and behaved according to the rules, to a teenager who thinks she knows everything. Don't you remember rolling your eyes at adults who had the audacity to think differently than you did? Don't you remember thinking that all adults were stupid? Isn't the assumption that you know everything one of the quintessential aspects of puberty? Have you ever stopped to think about the fact that these telltale characteristics are direct results of estrogen and progesterone? So this must mean that estrogen and progesterone have some kind of effect on your brain, which affects both your thinking and your behavior. And in the case of puberty, they make you feel smart. Even though you are young, inexperienced, foolish, and uneducated, you think you're smarter than everybody else. Oh, and that's not all. Estrogen and progesterone work on your brain to make you think about boys and sex, too. Suddenly, you notice boys, and being sexually desirable becomes a priority. So this means that estrogen and progesterone work on the parts of your brain that deal with relationships, love, and sex. And what happened to your performance in school? Statistics show that girls do much better in school before puberty. That's because those sex hormones that flood your brain at puberty bring with them lots of distractions. And while you might actually be smarter than the boys, your need to make them like you outweighs your desire to perform scholastically. So it's not uncommon for a girl's grades to start dropping at the time of puberty. This is partly because they don't want to outperform boys scholastically. It's not because they aren't as smart as the boys. Next, you spend about 30 years having monthly menstrual cycles. 
So let's talk about that part of your life. Here's how it would appear on our graph if we looked at the sum total of all 30 years of happy periods. Again, this is a very simplified representation, but it suffices for our purposes today. Along the x axis, the horizontal axis, you see ages from birth to puberty, and then ages 15 to 45 for the remainder of the graph. And during those years from age 15 to 45, you see what looks like a sawtooth pattern. Both estrogen and progesterone go up and down, up and down, again and again and again. This happens month after month after month for about 30 years. But if we take a single month representing a single menstrual cycle, it looks more like this. Here I've done my best to replicate a graph you've seen before in the very early videos of this menopause education. Here's the one you've seen before. This and my version of it represent a single 28-day cycle of the fluctuations in your estrogen and progesterone. Along the horizontal x-axis, you see days numbered from 1 to 28. The orange line is estrogen and the blue line is progesterone. Both estrogen and progesterone change throughout the cycle. So let's dissect this single cycle a bit to see how your brain changes with these hormonal fluctuations. And as we do this, I want you to reflect on your own cycles, either now or back in the day. We live <laughs> our lives one day at a time, and you may not notice certain patterns that are only evident by looking retrospectively. But when you do look retrospectively, sometimes you can see patterns that were not obvious in the moment. So take another look at our graph for a single cycle. Day one is always the first day you start bleeding, regardless of whether it's a lot of blood or just a little tiny spot of blood. So your cycle starts with your period, and the first seven days or so constitute your actual period. And you see that this first phase encompasses seven days during which you're both, during which both your estrogen level and your progesterone level are nice and flat. Both are low, but neither is zero. So during your period, there are no fluctuating hormones, and your estrogen and progesterone are low. How did your brain work during your period? This is where you let your own body tell you about the effect of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. We are not all the same. Some of you are probably thinking, gosh, my brain was pathetic during my periods while others are probably thinking their brains work just fine. Whichever applies to you is an indication of your brain's need for estrogen and or progesterone. Notice now that I said estrogen and or progesterone. That's because they're both steady during these seven days. It could be that your brain relies more on one than the other, but you'll have to wait and figure that out when one is higher and the other is lower. So let's do that. Look at the next segment of the menstrual cycle graph. Focus on days 8 through 13 and look at what's happening. Your estrogen is starting to skyrocket while your progesterone is rising more slowly and steadily. How did your brain function then? If yours function best during these six days, then your brain is probably very dependent on estrogen and not as much on progesterone. And if you function worst on these six days, your brain is probably not very dependent on estrogen. The vast majority of women feel that their brains are best right after their period finishes when their estrogen is at its highest. But we're all different. Now, take a look at the next segment of a single menstrual cycle. This encompasses days 14 to 18. It includes mid-cycle when you ovulate. Most women definitely feel most interested in sex at this time, and that's partly because their estrogen is so high. But it's also because you have a surge of testosterone then. I haven't included testosterone on this graph for the sake of simplicity. If I did, it would look like this. 
Now you see a gray line representing testosterone. It's low and stable all month except at the time of ovulation. And that's Mother Nature's way of making you want sex at just the right time to get pregnant. But other than the testosterone surge, this segment from day 14 to 18 is when your estrogen starts dropping and your progesterone starts rising. How well did your brain function then? If we move on to the next segment from day 19 to 24, your progesterone is higher than your estrogen. So this is the time just before PMS. Did your brain function at its best then? Or was it a time of struggle for focusing and accomplishing intellectual tasks? And finally, there are the last days of your cycle just before your next period begins. Notice that this is where your progesterone, which was at its highest, plummets. It just drops so rapidly, and your estrogen is fairly stable, but also very low. This is PMS time. So how well did your brain function just before your periods? Were you a whiz, or did you feel like your brain was sluggish and in a fog? Most women say their brains are mush at PMS time. If you experienced certain times in your cycles when your brain was at its best, take note. That's your brain talking to you, telling you that the hormone levels at that time were its best fuel. Knowing that may help you manage your menopause. Now, the problem with our assessment thus far is that no matter where you were in your cycle, you still had both estrogen and progesterone on board. So their presence was consistent. All that changed were fluctuations in their levels. And while that may be telling, there is sometimes a lag between what your hormones do and what you experience. So let's do a little more analysis to determine the effects of estrogen and progesterone on your brain. What if you get pregnant? What happens to your sex hormones then? Let's pick up where we left off before dissecting the, site, the single cycle. Here's how that graph looked. If we add pregnancy onto that graph and adjust the hormone levels accordingly to reflect the differences in the non-pregnant state and the pregnant state, it looks like this. Well, look at that. The levels of estrogen and progesterone in pregnancy make all the other phases of life look puny. Both your estrogen and your progesterone are sky high during pregnancy. How did your brain function during pregnancy? Were you but a blob unable to think about anything or were you full of wit and wisdom? Now, I have to tell you, the fact that both estrogen and progesterone is so high, are so high is very significant because they can counteract each other in a way. Progesterone definitely works on the emotional aspects of your brain, and that's why pregnant women can be so fickle. It would really be interesting to see the effect of these high levels of estrogen and progesterone in isolation. That would be very telling. I have a theory <laughs> that very high estrogen levels would make you feel like you have a super brain <laughs> and that very high progesterone levels would make you feel like you were practically brain dead. <laughs> but I say that because I know what happens later in life during perimenopause and postmenopause. So let's address those. Going back to our graph that we used before we got pregnant. <laughs> If we now add perimenopause to the graph, it looks like this. Now you see that I've added ages 46 through 50 to the chart with steadily decreasing progesterone for each additional year. That's because perimenopause is when your progesterone disappears. And the question becomes, how did your brain function when your progesterone disappeared? And notice that I left estrogen out of the picture. That's because although your estrogen has not yet disappeared at perimenopause, 
It is so confused that it's all over the place. And that makes it very difficult to assess the effect of progesterone loss on your brain. Again, I wish I could isolate them to get a clear picture. And finally, we get to postmenopause. This is when your estrogen disappears completely. Here it is on our graph. Now you see that I've added ages 51 through 90, <laughs> and estrogen is at rock bottom. So finally, we've reached a state of no estrogen or progesterone. This is the first opportunity to really compare how your brain functions with estrogen and progesterone versus without estrogen and progesterone. So I ask you, did your brain function better before you became postmenopausal or after you became postmenopausal? What's one of the most common symptoms of postmenopause? I've heard so many different names for this one phenomenon. Some of them are minnow fog, brain fog, fuzzy brain, forgetfulness, brain drain, etc. Did you have minnow fog, brain fog, fuzzy brain, forgetfulness, brain drain before you became postmenopausal? Or did it start when you lost your estrogen? Hmm, <laughs> do you think they're connected? Here's the big ticket item. There is no doubt that loss of your estrogen changes the way your brain functions. Of course, there are variations on whether the change in brain function is more significant during perimenopause or postmenopause. Your brain drain may be most significant when your estrogen is erratic during perimenopause or it may be more significant when your estrogen disappears completely at postmenopause. It may become less significant over time, either because your brain acclimates somewhat to the absence of estrogen or because you just lower your brain expectations. And if you have ever tried taking HRT after you became postmenopausal, what was the effect on your brain with regard to your mental fog, brain drain, or whatever? You see, your own body answers these questions for you. You don't need me. All you have to do is pay attention. And if you do have the typical foggy brain of menopause, you can do your own experiment to determine the effect of hormones on your brain. I always tell women to do self experiments. All you have to do is try something for two months. Time frames shorter than two months are not adequate for purposes of giving your body time to give you a verdict. If you watched this video and knew precisely how your brain functioned at each stage, then you probably already know the effect of estrogen and progesterone on your own brain. But if you watched this video and felt like you had no idea, then consider conducting a two-month experiment. All you have to do is see how your brain functions with HRT and how it functions without HRT. And then you can still do whatever you want to manage your menopause, but you'll know the difference. And you'll make decisions knowingly rather than unknowingly. And if your brain and your body disagree, you can still decide which one you want to listen to. I don't tell you what to do. I give you the tools with which to decide for yourself. Now, you can find studies on all of this. Some will say that your brain function improves with estrogen. Some will say it doesn't. Some will say progesterone has nothing to do with your brain function at all. Others will say that progesterone makes your brain function worse. Some will say it all depends on your age when you start HRT. Others will say age doesn't matter. And because there are so many different studies with so many different results, you'll be confused. But one thing is certain. None of those studies studied you. Don't you think it makes more sense to do your own experiment on your own brain and get an answer that is accurate for you? That's the best way to find the truth for yourself. So this is where I will leave you today. Keep pondering this. Next week, I'll address more specifically the effect of menopause on your brain, and you'll learn the science behind estrogen in your brain.
Go to menopausetaylor.me if you want a consultation. Subscribe right now and follow me on social media, which are Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Bye!